Hello everyone and welcome to this evening's 5x15 event. Last week marked the 75th birthday of the NHS, a milestone that's also been an opportunity to reflect on the importance of this life-saving institution, the bedrock of healthcare in this country ever since its founding in 1948. An anniversary like this is an occasion that has us looking to the past to celebrate the history of the service, but also to the urgent needs of the present moment, and of course to the future, and the vital need to support and protect the NHS from cuts and the many ongoing challenges that it faces. At 5x15 we of course strongly believe in the role that storytelling has to play in illuminating some of the most important issues of our day. Which is why we're so pleased tonight to be hosting a conversation about Polly Morland's book, A Fortunate Woman. Inspired in part by John Berger's 1967 book, A Fortunate Man, a pioneering account of the life and work of a country doctor, A Fortunate Woman is many things, an inspiring and moving portrait of a country doctor who works in the same remote wooded valley that she's lived in for many years, a love letter to a landscape and an exploration of medicine and what it means to be a good doctor. If you haven't already got yourselves a copy of A Fortunate Woman, it's on sale this evening as usual from our wonderful bookselling partner, New and Books. And details about how to order yourselves a copy will be posted in the chat. And don't just take our word for it either. As well as being a Sunday Times bestseller, A Fortunate Woman has been highly acclaimed since its publication. It was shortlisted for the Bailey Gifford Prize for Nonfiction and named the Book of the Year by The Times and The New Statesman, who described it as a work that deepens our understanding of the life and thoughts of a modern doctor and the modern NHS. Polly Morland is also the author of several other books, including The Society of Timid Souls, which won the Guardian First Book of the Year Award and was also a Sunday Times Book of the Year. She is a writer and a documentary maker and worked for 15 years in television, producing and directing documentaries for the BBC, Channel 4 and Discovery. We're delighted that Polly will be in conversation this evening with another leading author and storyteller, Dr Rachel Clark. Before going to medical school, Rachel was a television journalist and documentary maker. She now specialises in palliative medicine, helping patients to live to the end of their lives as richly and fully as possible. Rachel is also the author of three best-selling books, Breathtaking, which reveals what life was like inside the NHS during the first wave of the COVID-19 pandemic, Dear Life, based on her work in a hospice, which was shortlisted for the 2020 Costa Biography Award, and Your Life in My Hands, which documents life as a junior doctor on the NHS front line. Polly and Rachel will be in conversation this evening for around 45 minutes, and in the last 50 minutes there'll be time to respond to some of your questions from the audience too. So please do post these at the Q&A box at any time during the event, and we'll get to as many as we can. Without any further ado, it's my absolute pleasure to welcome Polly Morland and Rachel Clark. Over to you. Thank you very much, uh, Jack, and um, welcome. Polly and everybody joining us this evening. It is my absolute pleasure and privilege to be interviewing you, Polly, this evening. I think that uh, A Fortunate Woman is one of the most beautiful and, and penetrating books about the essence of healthcare and medicine that I have ever read, and I read them all. Um, it's just gorgeous. So for anyone who is listening this evening and has not read this book, I, I, I strongly, strongly recommend it. It's, it's exquisite writing, and it really captures something quintessential about all the qualities that seem to matter most of all in healthcare. Uh, but one of the things that I love almost as much as the way you write, Polly, is the, as it were, origin story uh, of this book, because it's extraordinary. I wondered if you could explain a little bit about the serendipity that, that, that led to you writing this book and why you decided to undertake it. Yes, I mean, of course, because in a sense, it's a book that came about by accident. Um, as is not very often the case <laughs> as journalists generally we go and look for stories we don't wait for stories to find us but but um but this story really in a sense found me um so what, this was back in the in this for the first spring of the pandemic late spring may 2020 and i was clearing my elderly mother's house she'd been very ill with alzheimer's and, and, and had to go into a care home and I was clearing her house. She was a great lover of books. And I found an old penguin paperback that had fallen down behind one of the shelves. I'd, um, my mother lived other end of the country from me. 
up in the Midlands and uh, and I'd, I'd taken this, this paper back out from behind the shelf, smoothed the dust off it, and it was called A Fortunate Man. It was a book by the, the writer and critic John Berger. Now, I'd, I'd read some Berger, but I'd, I'd never come across this book, A Fortunate Man, the story of a country doctor it said on the cover and it had this beautiful black and white photograph of a doctor attending to a patient on the cover. I'd opened it and, and on the opening double page spread of the book was a picture of a landscape, which I immediately recognised as the landscape in which I live, the valley in which I live. It was this, this um, thick meadow with a river running through it and a great rise of dark woodland. And I thought I'd, I'd just, I drove past that field, that, that meadow this morning. And uh, it, I, I'm flicking through the book and then I'm devouring it that very evening. I, this, I realised that this, John Burgess was this account of, a documentary account really, of, of, a, of a country doctor serving this valley community in the mid 1960s. And it's this very intimate account of his life and his work and an examination of what it means to be a doctor. And in just in a moment, the idea, in a sense, the, the impetus for a fortunate woman came about in a flash because I knew the doctor who serves that community today, you know, who's a remarkable woman, very, uh, very well loved in our community. And she's working in exactly the practice that the, the doctor in John Berger's book was also serving. Um, and so from that, absolute you know moment of serendipity complete coincidence then grew this process so it started as 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 thinking about how fascinating particularly at the hot you know as the pandemic raged how fascinating it would be and how important and how urgently needed a fresh look at the place of primary care might might be so there was an, there was an urgent journalistic reason to pick up this story again but it all started with that that one small moment of coincidence and from that the the project of the book unfolded mm. It's really fascinating. I mean, if ever a book seemed like it was destined to come into being, this is this is it. Um, and so I, I know you, you describe you 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 get in touch with the the, the GP in question and, and ask if you can chat and you meet her. And I wonder how, what did you propose to her in that first conversation about what you wanted to undertake and how did you both together wrestle with the ethics around the idea of you as, as a journalist, as a writer, actually being present in, in the consulting room? Mm. So um, I'd emailed her, I mean, pretty much immediately. And I'd said, you know, I'd started by saying, I don't know whether you've ever come across this John Berger book um, that was written about this very practice, but, you know, a little over 50 years ago. So written when the, when the NHS was about 15. 15, 16 years old, um, you know, could I come and talk to you about it? I, I, I wonder whether, could I just come and talk to you about it? And so, so in that opening conversation, I mean, she, she'd replied immediately. I heard back from her within, you know, within the hour saying, yes, I know that book. Yes, it had a huge influence on my part my career pathway as a doctor and and you know I'll, I'll, I'll explain how yes we should meet so so we'd we'd met and we talked about how how and whether if one were to look at this story again we'd be undertaking something that wasn't pure nostalgia <laughs> you know it just Yes, it's 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 lovely. It's lovely the coincidence, but what is there to say today? And she, and she is one of the most passionate advocates for both the, the joy of general practice, the vocation of general practitioners that you will ever meet. And so she had a, in a sense, a. Uh, as strong a feeling as I did that there was a vitally important and con you know, urgently contemporary story to be told about general practice now. I mean, it's often, it's often said that, you know, many among the public, many healthcare policy makers don't really understand mm -hmm. general practice and that there would be real value in 
unpacking for a contemporary audience, somewhat in the way the Berger unpacked for a 1960s audience, the essence of that work of the ordinary. Yeah. Well, as, as Berger says, in, you know, in his introduction, you know, uh, we do not in our society understand the work of an ordinary working doctor. Mm. Um, mm. And I think that is still the case. So I think we both felt passionately there was a there was a powerful contemporary reason for revisiting mm. the story that that I had this deep emotional connection with the old book that she also had this deep very different coming from an entirely different place in that it had been so powerful in in, in influencing her as a young doctor and in her the way in which she chose general practice and it's some and the way she came to understand some of the underlying principles of general practice so we coming from these opposite points we could see that there was a compelling reason to do it now there then opens up the you know the the you know significant ethical considerations to be taken into account if one were to um, take that documentary approach with a contemporary doctor so mm -hmm. um also um, furthermore we will um, the so the book is essentially built around a year of observation and conversation um uh and during the sort of running from from the latter portions of 2020 through 2021 was the period of time that we spent together but those um but we relied because of in, in some sense the, the kind of COVID rules, I couldn't be in the consulting room a, a, a huge amount. So there were elements of observation, but there were these very, very long conversations about her whole life and her vocation mm -hmm. and how she came to be a doctor and about her childhood and about her early years in training. And so we were able through those conversations to in a way open the story right up beyond the kind of crisis that was unfolding in during COVID itself. And, and these conversations, we the, the valley in which the, the book takes place, um, uh, so the doctor is never named. You'll notice I'm I'm na naming neither the doctor nor the valley. John Berger named neither the location nor he gave his doctor a pseudonym. Um, the doctor is merely the doctor in a fortune mm. woman. Um, uh, but the but this this landscape we we walked through this exquisite wooded landscape where we where we both live for these incredibly long walks where we were really able to drill down into the essence of her work and what makes her tick and what really matters in this branch of medicine so mm -hmm. it was a combination of observation and conversation obviously the the book itself is is um is threaded together with accounts of consultations stories human yes. stories from the community and you know, and and in in many sense though the you know the 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 book is about the doctor and the community it's all about also about the relationship between community and place and the valley in which the the story takes place is is as much a character in the book as the doctor yes. <laughs> in a sense um but the consultations themselves those are protected by mm -hmm. ethical considerations anonymity uh, you know very strict rules around confidentiality so the the stories in the book are no no story relates to a one particular case or they, they've been anonymized and rendered into composites in yes. order to be absolutely watertight from a, a, an anonymity and confidentiality yeah. Um, There's a, a a strong sense when you read the book that perhaps what motivates or motivated the doctor to undertake this project with you is a very palpable sense of precariousness almost that she feels as though these qualities aspects of healthcare that are so incredibly important in forming the bedrock of being a good physician and good general practitioner are actually under threat in a modern NHS and I don't mean necessarily just by the sort of hostility that is spewed at GPs from many public quarters I'm not naming you particularly Daily Mail but you're one of them um, you know it, it's not just that it's that actually the, the architecture of the NHS 
today makes it almost impossible to be the kind of doctor that she so vehemently fights to be for her patients. It, 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 is that right? Yes, I mean, and I think what we're talking about, and absolutely it's right, that sense of precarity, the sense that this is something that is falling away from us. And, and what is falling away is the is something that the old doctor in John Berger's book would have taken entirely for granted. It was there by default in the way in which he practiced, not by design, simply by default, mm -hmm. which is the absolute centrality of the relationship between doctor and patient. So it was that experience, which, you know, lots of us will remember from our childhood of having a GP who you know, yeah. mine was Dr. Gibson in, you know, and, I, and, and Dr. Gibson looked after all of us um, up in Glasgow when I was a kid. And, um, you know, that sense of a doctor that you know, and that how fundamental that relationship between that longitudinal relationship between doctor and patient is you know um you know both to doctors and to patients how how meshed into the process of giving good care that relationship is and so I suppose in, in some sense that's that is really what the book sets out to explore and to explore through through stories, through stories yes. of individual patients and stories of the doctor's work and stories of the community is to look at that relationship, which we once took entirely for granted. Yes. But as healthcare has changed and there have been many, many factors driving that, it has been progressively, whilst people, you know, so I think any healthcare policymaker would still say continuity of care doctor-patient relationship, oh yes, absolutely the gold standard, absolutely important. However, in terms of where it sits within the structure of healthcare policy, it has been increasingly marginalised and rendered impossible by a number of complex factors, both to do with po policy and the way in which society has changed, the way in which our communities have changed and so on. Um, but really what the doctor in, in, in my book has, by virtue of the community that she's working in and by virtue of the fact that she has been in, in post for more than 20 years, it's over 130,000 patient encounters over those two decades, huge number, of, has been able to fragment by fragment, consultation by consultation, build those deep, long-standing relationships with her patients. Mm -hmm. And... It is both the source of her joy and the job, but it also makes her better at the job. And I suppose the, the book really tries to explore both how vital that relationship and the trust that flows from it is to, you know, the role it plays in, in medical outcomes mm. and also in the satisfaction of the physician themselves. And you have a wonderful uh, phrase that captures this centrality of the relationship, which is a, about medicine being um, a, a, a braiding of biology and biography. So science and story, um, which is absolutely the essence of, should in my view, be the essence of every good medical consultation. But let's have an example. Can you describe one of the encounters that you you witnessed that really encapsulated this? So there's a there's a there's a story that comes quite early on in the book, and it's a it's a really good example of how knowing the patient and knowing their life and knowing their community allows the doctor to to help the patient. So there's a there's a farmer, this comes very early on in the book, there's a farmer who, um, who arrives in the consulting room, walks in, she's known him for a long time, and he walks into the room with something of a pronounced limp that she has not seen before. She's familiar with him, she knows him. They, they talk and he said, oh, I'm, I'm here about, oh, I've got a chest, you know, chesty cough, chesty cough. She does this examination, but she uh, is aware of, She's aware of his physicality and how, what his physicality is normally like. And that there's something still and tense in the way that he's holding himself. And he has his hand on the upper portion of his one, one thigh. 
and it, it's teased out over the course of this um, this consultation that she eventually sort of says that limp, that limp. You don't know. You don't normally. You don't normally walk with a limp. What? You know, he said, oh, bit of a tussle with a gate the other day. No, 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 it's nothing. And she said, well, no. And she gets him to describe the symptoms that he's experiencing. And then absolutely insists on sending him for an X-ray. And he said, I haven't got time for an X-ray. We're lambing at the moment. I'm, and he, she's like, how do you manage to lamb with that leg? And, 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 uh, and he says, well, I, I'm, you know, I, 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 I crawl. After a ewe has given birth, I crawl over to the quad and I use the little ladder there on the side to pull myself up. It, he's sent off for, for the x-ray and it transpires that he has broken the neck of his femur, broken hip, and has been, um, has been walking, limping and lambing with a broken hip for the best part of two weeks. But it's one of those consultations where it took the relationship, it took the knowing him, it took understanding what lambing season is like and that no one, and that, and it's knowing that farmers never show, never show up in your consulting room unless there's something seriously wrong. Um, and so it's, a, it's, it's both, a, it's a combination of knowledge of the individual, that man, and also the collective, the community, the timing of the seasons, what happens at that time of year, the, the broader kind of cultural dynamics of that, um, of, that of that community of farmers that allows her to be a good doctor in, in that place. And that's one of, those, um, one of those stories that really demonstrated that. Mm. And, and what you've just described there, Polly, is, is I, I imagine for everybody watching this this evening uh, exactly what we all yearn for in our doctors. We want our doctors to know us, to listen to us, to attend to us, to really pay attention to the consultation, be there with you in the here and now. Uh, and of course, that experience is sadly few and far between at the moment in the NHS, which is unbelievably understaffed uh everybody's chasing their tails it's very it's hard even to you know tap away on your computer for five minutes let alone really take the time and energy to know your patients mm -hmm. um and so i wonder did the doctor feel distressed by that pessimistic did she have any kind of hope or suggestions for how to maintain that as the core of good medical practice I mean, so it's interesting. She would say on the one hand that she was fortunate, a fortunate woman. She was lucky to be working in a community where that was possible. And she is not, you know, she's, you know, she's tremendously busy, but she is within a community that is a very stable community. She has been in post for a long time. At that stage, she was working completely full time. Um, so was there, so there were a number of factors that had allowed her to become embedded in that community. But that the number of doctors for whom that GPs for whom that is the case is 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 very significantly declining. And it's in, in real that that you know, I, I think you would struggle to to meet a GP who wouldn't say, that that was what they wanted, and perhaps what they that what they'd had in the past, and it would be the heart of the, their joy and the job, but that it's hard for in many cases to maintain that. Mm. In terms of in terms of how one might maintain that, so for sure she is both an exemplary doctor. And she has chosen the way that she works, but she also works in a situation in which and, and, and in a practice, small practice in a rural community where that is possible. Nevertheless, it's been, you know, it's been interesting it, it, over the weeks that I've been talking about this book is that I quite often after events, um, GPs have come up to me and said, oh, well, I, I work in an urban practice or I, I work in a suburban practice, but I've been in post 20 years, 18 years, and I know mm. lots of my patients as well. It, it, it it can be possible, but what it, what in a sense, the tragedy of what's unfolding is the extent to which that 
that relationship has been sidelined in policy. So it's not incentivized, it's not made central to healthcare policy. It's not, um, for instance, incorporated a continuity of care is not incorporated in any of the 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 um the the incentives within the quaf the quality outcomes framework mm. by which the uh, which is the framework of performance related pay for general practitioners and so there's a there's a sense in which the the broader system has drifted towards a rather more transactional model of healthcare rather than a relational model and so while there are the doctor in, in my book and and GPs all over the country, still there are pockets of this continuity of care all over the place. But they are under extreme pressure to do with workload, to do with workforce. Mm. And that without opening up a much broader conversation about how important, how central that relationship is, and how vital to good medical outcomes it is, it, there, we run the risk of it just being pushed further and further and mm -hmm. further towards the margins. It, it, I think the doctor in, in, I think, sorry, but I think the doctor in, in my book would say, look, it is possible. She is, a, you know, it's so it's often framed as a kind of um, something that's a little bit old fashioned or quaint, or is it a, mm. a darling little rural story of a rather old fashioned practice? It's not. It's a perfectly modern practice, <laughs> working with a multi, you know, a, a, quite a small, tight team, a couple of practice nurses, some healthcare assistants. You know, they work very, you know, a couple of partners. They work very closely and tightly together, and it is possible. So I think she would make the point that. Sure, it's hard and it's not, you know, there are often many circumstantial factors that, that put, put intolerable pressure on that relationship, but it is possible and it certainly ain't quaint, <laughs> you know, no. it's contemporary good practice of medicine. No. Absolutely. And there seems to be something, uh, I'm not quite sure if the word is paradoxical, uh, I, uh, cynical almost about the fact that uh you know th this month the month of the nhs's 75th birthday we have had um, a chorus of politicians uh, in the media sort of celebrating the wonderful care that is the essence of our great nhs uh while you could argue presiding over well over a decade of um uh, excuse me, um, paying a uh, singular lack of attention to the thing that provides that care, which is, of course, a workforce of human beings who are being expected to do um, increasingly more with, with less resources and therefore coming under increasing pressures that make it all the harder to enter into meaningful relationships with um uh, with their patients. I apologise for being slightly distracted. Oh. I don't know if you, you you witnessed a child coming into my room. It's so cool. <laughs> okay. <laughs> um, and that makes me feel this is a very poignant conversation. I, I, I As someone who works within the NHS aged 75, I'm very fearful that somehow we now operate in a, in an NHS that only actually tries to nourish the things that can be counted, hard data on a spreadsheet, anything that can't be counted, care, relationships, continuity, they get erased precisely because they don't, they can't demonstrate performance on a spreadsheet. Is, is that a, a fear you share? I mean, uh, certainly, I mean, I think there is a respect in which continuity has been sidelined because it's so difficult to measure. So how, what is the value of uh, the relationship with a, between doctor and patient? How do you, how do you, how do you slap some num numbers around that? I think is undoubtedly, you know, much harder to measure than the efficacy of a new pharmacological intervention for COPD yeah. or diabetes meds, sure. However, there is a, you know, significant and growing body of research where, I mean, I think that I think has flowed from this sense of 
I don't think it's hyperbolic to call it existential crisis within mm-hmm. general practice about the about the place of the relationship and about that value of continuity of care. And so there there's, there was an, there have been a handful of extraordinary studies that show and and actually have worked to enumerate how um, continuity of care, you know, uh, brings about closer adherence to medical advice, for instance, or better uptake of vaccines, reduced use of out of hours service, Mm. very expensive, you know, uh, lower referral rates, also very expensive, lower hospital admissions, a, a, a accident, a, a accident, and emergency admissions with good continue, good continuity of GP care, care. Not to mention, you know, uh, greater patient satisfaction, and so on. There's even there's an extraordinary study that came from came out of Norway, large scale, population wide study that came out of Norway um, in 2021. So it's a study of four and a half million people, mm-hmm. large sample size, large large sample size. And that looked at the impact of of, um, up to 15 years of continuity on patient outcomes. And at 15 years of continuity of care, there was a 25% reduction in mortality. So there there are some proper hard numbers out there. They just need to, you know, it's it needs the discussion, it needs the airing, it needs to drift back towards the, in my view, towards the center of what we're talking about when we're talking about primary care. Yes. Um, and the the meshing of uh, exactly as you say, biology, biography, science, yeah. and story. So you need those, you need those numbers. I see that. And if we're going to work out the value of the relationship, we have to measure it. And people are beginning to do that. And I would argue that it, 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 it urgently needs closer examination, more measuring, more study, possibly a randomised control trial. Some of those ways of really drilling down into how important this is and what a difference it makes. That It's more than just, oh, it'd be awfully nice, you know, it'd be it's so fluffy. nice comfy cozy bit you know yeah oh it's nice to see a doctor who knows no it makes a difference it it is better for your health and it is also much much better for doctors so if you are in a situation where there is a a, you know a serious problem with retention of gps i mean there's you know people gps are voting against the pressures of contemporary healthcare with their feet Absolutely. If you're going to yes. push back against that, there is, you know, the job satisfaction and the and 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 thinking about some of the factors that contribute to burnout is part mm-hmm. of that, and mm-hmm. the relationship is part of that story too. Mm-hmm. Absolutely. And I'm just going to pause for a moment now and just remind everybody to please post your questions. I have got some excellent questions coming in um, in the Q and A, uh, and we'll be moving to those very shortly. So so do add adds to that. Um, I I want to pick up on something you've just mentioned, burnout. Uh, And of course, one of the things that comes through very strongly in your conversations with this GP uh, is the deep, deep joy, a word you used, a joy that she experiences, fulfillment, reward, satisfaction, um, a, a job that clearly touches her deeply and gives her a a great deal of what we all know matters in our lives. We want to be engaged in a meaningful project with our lives, hopefully that helps people. Uh, And of course, if a doctor who almost certainly went into medicine with the aspiration of trying to help people feels as though they are operating in a system that no longer enables them or supports them to do that, for example, uh, many of the modern general practices in Britain today where there isn't continuity of care, there are not named doctors for patients, you will see a different person every time you attend, etc, cetera, etc. Cetera. That can have uh, incredibly damaging effects over time on the morale, the well-being, the, the mental health of doctors. Um, 
And is that something that you picked up as a, as, as a significant problem in your conversations with your doctor? Well, I, I mean, it's in a sense, the doctor and a fortunate woman is in some sense one of the exceptions that proves the rule or, you know, mm. so it's interesting. We, what, look, I'm trying to think of the best way of saying this. I wanted to tell a story, you know, so stories can, it, and it's important to say that the book is, is not a particularly, I'm not sort of tub pumping about policy. It's, it's primarily a very story driven book. And it's a story about the nature of medical vocation at some level. And so her, the, the, the doctor in the book's powerful sense of, well, she says, it's the best job in the world. <laughs> being a GP is the best job in the world um and she means it and she lives it which mm. was that is not to say I mean she's not pollyanna -ish. my god no she sees the challenges on every side but I think she felt it was powerfully important to communicate that passion for the job and that it was and that it was and that it was possible that it mm. is possible mm. um, you know and, and and there's a sense in which her story you know if you think about the way in which stories can you know so it's just one small story in a sense the book is 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 a sort of portrait in miniature at some level but it opens up i i hope opens up a much much bigger conversation about the the how vital that sense of vocation is and and how vital that doctor patient relationship is and so i suppose in a sense her story which is in many ways a hopeful one <laughs> Yes. So I think you know, that it, that hopefully that, that that hopeful story can can, in a sense, be a prism through which to look at what we value. In yes. Healthcare. And and so I, you know, the book's built around many, 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 many hours of conversation with the doctor herself, but also lots of conversations with her patients, lots of conversations in the community. So it's a sense of not just what goes on in the consulting room, but the world in which she works um, and that relationship between medicine and society or doctors and their communities is also something that the book sets out to explore in miniature but but some of those ideas about the place of doctors in our society and and how vital that relationship with them is yes beautifully put <laughs> um I am going to bring in some questions now from our audience because they're excellent and I'm going to start with a question from Alice who says as a relatively new mother are there any stories about women pregnancy postpartum care in the book I wish I'd had more continuity of care during pregnancy with a doctor does the doctor in the book have children hi Alice um yes there are some um there is there's one there's one very powerful story about a woman who appears to be miscarrying having previously lost um I think had I think it's her fourth pregnancy so she's had three miscarriages and there's uh this this story unfolds there is a happy ending to this story, I'm happy to say, but there's this very dramatic scene between this, this young mother and the doctor um, in the consulting room. And there is, it's another instance where the fact that the, the doctor knows this patient and knows her history is, uh, enables her to give her the most compassionate care in that moment of crisis. Um, and yes, she does have children. Yes, she has two sons two teenage sons and so um in a sense and, you know, I mean it's interesting actually the extent to which her family life is also meshed into her relationship <laughs> with the community so she she often has some um, you know patients going oh how's you know how are the sons how, how are the boys what are they up to you know so there's a sense in which she as a whole person is 
part of how she functions as a doctor and I think it allows her to be a better doctor. Yes, although also potentially makes her vulnerable because if you're giving your whole self to work, you can be damaged by that or yes. worn down by that. Yes, I mean, I think uh, she... I mean, it's something that that I touch on in a few places in the book, her capacity to, so she takes very seriously not getting burnt out. Yes. You know, she's mindful about not getting burnt out. She's conscious of, of how bad it can get for some doctors in her position. And, you know, she... She exercises, she spends a lot of time out of doors as much as she can. She lives in this beautiful place. She, she works hard, conscious, you know, it's she's consciously works at the life and work balance. Mm. And is, you know, also has more energy than anyone I have ever met. <laughs> so <laughs> um, has a prodigious capacity to both live and work, I suppose. Yes, yes. Yeah. Here is a question from Ellen, who says she recently heard a previous president of the Royal College of Physicians say that the NHS is now a national illness service because it has no time or resources to work preventatively. And what do you feel about that? Yeah, and, and that's, a, it's, I mean, it's, su it's, a, it's such a good point because, and mm. it's also a very significant part of, of the work of, uh, of um, a GPs of primary care is to work on the prevention piece. I mean, that is that sits so squarely within the, the primary care uh, remit. And, um, and there are, you know, there are really quite a few stories in, in A Fortunate Woman in which the, you know, the doctor's trying to, you know, is working on the working on things that are never, you know, in a sense, trying to stop the crises of the future mm -hmm. through preventative and through um through the you know and I I suppose the important thing to say is that if there is something about looking at the whole person so rather than simply looking at the pathology and that is very much the way that the doctor and a fortunate woman works that looking at the whole person supports that 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 work of of preventative as well as you know dealing with the illness when it when it comes along but again it remains a huge challenge and in communities where you know where you know in deprived communities and communities where there is a particular density of complexity in term in, in terms of the prevention piece you know it remains a you know a very significant a very significant challenge mm -hmm. This is a question from a GP who's watching this evening called Abby. And she says, I loved the book. <laughs> Thank you. And she wonders as a GP, to what extent the doctor is able to achieve a successful vocation? Uh, to what extent is that dependent on the support she receives from her husband? She goes on, my experience has often been that it's the families of GPs who provide the scaffold for the service which GPs give to their patient communities and notes that this is an unrecognised cost in inverted commas within the NHS. Our families also take so much of the pressures we experience. I mean, undoubtedly in the case of the doctor and a fortunate woman. And so there's a, there is a little, little scene where where well, we came out of a conversation with um, the doctor's husband where he'd say, oh, I, I, I don't think she could do what she does without me there. And she'd said, no way. I mean, I could, she absolutely couldn't. So I think it's, um, no, I think without a shadow of a doubt, she would say that her her family, that, that the role of her husband, uh, it was inc is incredibly central to her being mm. able to do the job well. And it's interesting. It's a sort of um, Abby. If you've read the book, then you'll 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 remember that the the doctor in John Berger's book, A Fortunate Man, had a um, uh, was uh, he was married, had a wife called Betty. Um, who's in, almost entirely written out of a fortunate man. But actually my um, research that I did around that story, it transpires that, that Dr. John's wife, Betty, 
was incredibly central to his work. Um, and, uh, and so it was definitely something I wanted to do when writing A Fortunate Ro Woman was not to, to write out the family as, as in a sense the family were written out of, of Burgess' A Fortunate mm. Woman. Mm. Now, Polly, this is a, another very good question, which is going to slightly put you on the spot. Uh, this is from Els Yetta who asks, could we hear a short passage from the book? And I know you and I speculated about whether or not passages worked on Zoom as well as in the flesh, but Elzbieta is keen for one. And she also writes, could Polly say something about her writing style? What was important for you at the sentence word level, not just the larger stories? Oh, shall I? Why don't I answer the question first? And while, while I'm while, while you think round yes, in my head, yes, you can I'll, multitask, Polly. Because it'll be um, it'll I'll just do something very short. Um, the answer is hugely important. The 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 sentence level of the writing is 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 of of huge importance to me, and the kind of music within the language and the extent to which so any of you that have read the book might have a sense of this and, but the the extent to which I wanted to write about the landscape and the place in a way that wasn't simply as a sort of setting you know here's the backdrop here's a leafy back here's the real action there's the leafy backdrop I want because it's not the way that we live in the places that we live whether it's a leafy backdrop or in you know inner city streets we are very enmeshed in the places that we live and so I very much tried to do that at the sentence level so that the place reflected in a sense the inner lives of the people that are living here and the inner mm -hmm. life of the doctor who is working here um, and so the in a sense the the music of the language was incredibly important part of telling the story well because the story is about it's about our hearts in a sense mm -hmm. our, our hearts physically and our hearts emotionally and that I, that to deliver that through as it were ice cold prose didn't seem the right thing to do it was mm. uh, so i um yes so i was um, i worked very hard <laughs> on the uh, on the the idiom if you like of mm. the storytelling and i also wanted to conjure a voice for this book that might have something more in common with a novel or with a you know i really wanted the sense of story to lead because of, I mean, I mentioned this earlier, the sense in which I wanted readers to emotionally connect with the mm. stories, because mm. the substance of it, which is that political stuff of this stuff matters, mm. I wanted them to feel that it mattered. Yes. Uh, as well as be told. I wanted to show, not tell. Yes. Yes. Uh, so there is a, there's a tiny little short bit. I'll let, give me two seconds and I will try and remember where it is. Russell, Russell. While you're finding it, Polly, oh God, yes, please. I will read oh, a message from Alison, who has just posted something which is a comment rather than a question. So it gives you time oh, to good. find your thank you. Find your piece. Thank you. But it's but a no, very no. beautiful comment. Alison is a retired midwife, and she says. I worked with an amazing team offering true continuity from initial contact, being with the women we knew as they had their babies and supporting the new family postpartum. We had so much evidence to support continuity, but there is not the political will to support this type of care. To my team and students, I always explained we needed to think as a network of family and friends to refill our jug of love and compassion as it was drained daily, Alison beautiful words that uh, echo my experience in palliative medicine as well just absolutely couldn't agree more and maybe that's given you a chance to find it has. piece. <laughs> I had the passage in mind and I couldn't find the page but okay. now it's dead short 
Um, some days the doctor feels that she is suspended between the old world and an unfathomable future. Of all medical specialisms, indeed of all professions, there can be few others in which one is afforded such privileged access to lives that in aggregate span beyond two centuries. Her oldest patient's now frail part began to beat in the aftermath of the First World War. Her youngest, if you discount the numerous lives in utero, will likely do so well into the 22nd century. All those heartbeats, all that experience, all those stories, all that change. There is something both magnificently grand about it, like the great sweep of the Valley Gorge, and yet miniature, exquisite, like one of the forget-me-nots that sprout between the paving slabs outside her cottage. Gorgeous, absolutely beautiful writing, Polly. It's wonderful. And it's... Uh... It's it's very interesting in the same way that uh, the potency of, of, of what you're getting at, the extent to which care matters, comes indirectly from the way you write about it. I, I, I would argue that so too when a doctor is um, asking a patient to tell them their story and they're looking to interpret the patient's words and also the signs, the revelations that you, you acquire from examining and inspecting a patient's body, all of that is subtle and indirect as well and somehow works together to, to form a diagnosis. Mm -hmm. um, anyway, I have an excellent question here from an anonymous um, uh, uh, participant this evening who says, it's very simple, Polly, I'm sure you can answer this in one minute. What can we do as individuals to help protect the NHS and preserve the quality of care you write about? In one minute. It's a tough question. Make a noise about what matters. So I think there is a sense in which this conversation about whether we want the transactional care model or whether we want the relationship-based care model in which people are people rather than pathologies, simply. Mm -hmm. I think we need to talk about it. I think we need to write to our MPs. We need to <laughs> make a noise. I mean, I think we have to make a noise. In term, at, at pol you know, I'm not a healthcare policy maker. Clearly, there is a significant need for investment. I mean, the NHS urgently in primary care urgently needs greater investment. You know, I've got a stat here somewhere. I'm going to I'm going to tell you it is. So over the last decade, healthcare spending fallen by 25 percent. General practice slice of that pie has dropped from 11 to 7 percent. I mean, it's mm -hmm. got squeezed and squeezed and squeezed. But I think we have to make a noise and, and we will be told, oh, this is an old, fa you know, you want something old fashioned. You, you, you can't have what it was in 1948. I am not arguing for what it was in 1948. I'm talking about the design of a, a design of healthcare policy that enables and nourishes that relationship between doctor and patient, because I think it's vital. But mm -hmm. I think we need to make a noise. Here, mm here. -hmm. Yeah, yeah could not agree more strongly. Uh, you mentioned towards the end of the book something that I found very compelling, which is the phrase that, um, in your view, the lifeblood of general practice is trust. What do you mean by that? So I think it underpins a doctor's ability to do their job well. So I think it underpins the clinical process in terms of, and, and I listed some of these things earlier, you know, so you're, you're more likely, you know, you're more likely to take your medication, you're more likely to follow medical advice, you're more likely to take, vac um, you know, uptake of vaccines, you're, you mm. know, so there are, there are some, there are some practical nitty gritty 
elements to to the ways in which trust supports good outcomes but i also think it's it's enmeshed in the very founding philosophy of the nhs 75 years old last wednesday the sense in which it is this cradle cradle to grave care free at the point of delivery regardless of your place in society you will be given the the same standard of compassionate care that is so enmeshed in the in the the fundamental founding philosophy of the nhs and that i think without i think that is you know um that is the lifeblood of trust that requires trust that is enmeshed in the whole in the entire thinking about that in that it's universal mm. um so i so but i think it's so it's universal that, that that's up there, right up here but there is also the person to person it's about people and about how people relate to one another mm. Mm. absolutely and looking forward polly despite everything the difficulties in healthcare that we've discussed this evening are you hopeful for the future of general practice in Britain in the NHS? I hope that I'm hopeful. I mean, the G I've now talked to so many GPs and they, you know, I have uh, such a dedicated and incredible group of people who still hold all these ideas absolutely central. I'm not meeting a lot of people who go, oh, no, we don't, we don't do that anymore. Oh, no, that's not. All. You know, so quite. So I am very hopeful because of the extraordinary people working in it. I am fearful about the. I'm fearful about it at government level. I think it's. I, I, I'm the the discussion about the broken NHS or pro, broken primary care. I mean, that's. There may not be a space to interrogate that here. The people I've met aren't broken, but they are at the end of their rope and mm. they need our help and they need the help of mm. government to make, to allow them to do what they're there to do and allow the NHS to continue to, or to come from this, this pretty crunch point and return to something that feels more like it's flourishing. Mm. Uh, um, am I hopeful? I want to be hopeful. I want to be hopeful. Mm. Perhaps. Are, are you hopeful, Rachel? Yes, I am. Well, because I think that hope is not a feeling. I think that hope is an action, hoping is, is a verb, it's a doing word. Mm -hmm. And the only way to be hopeful is to act and fight for the thing that you love and you want to sustain and you want to keep in existence and keep surviving. Um, and the moment you stop acting and trying and not giving up and trying to keep or enable the things to flourish that you think matter, that's when you give up. That's when it's game over because the moment you lose hope and lose heart, they've won. You've lost. You won't keep the things that are precious. But if you, if all you do is write to your MP, tweet, complain, talk to your neighbours about it, say, no, those headlines in that paper about GPs are not true. Those are all actions, they're, they're, they're forms of active hope. And that's how we keep the NHS we love and, and we know we want. Mm. Oh, hear, hear. It's not about, it's not about optimism, you know, smiling no. optimism. It's about being, you know, hopeful action. Yeah, indeed. yeah. and the, maybe, brilliant. maybe the best things in life all of them are not fluffy at all, far from it. They are hard fought, hard won, and we have to be fierce and, and committed and, and, and full of will to, to keep them in society, maybe. 
I think perhaps your doctor in her valley has a real ferocity to her at heart, doesn't she? Oh, my goodness. Absolutely. A real ferocity and a, and a passion and is interestingly, is tremendously hopeful, is tremendously hopeful, but with with a kind of fierce edge of making it so. Yes. She's fine and she will make it so. Yes. And Polly, I sense that you may share some of those qualities too. <laughs> In a good way. I hope so. In a good way. <laughs> Thank you so much, Polly Morland. It has been an absolute pleasure discussing A Fortunate Woman with you this evening. It is the most wonderful book. Uh, and I really urge everybody listening who hasn't read it to, to buy it immediately it's just tremendous it's it's not just about medicine and the NHS it's about life and what matters in life and it's gorgeously written thank you Polly thank you. I'm very very much looking forward to reading whatever it is you produce next thank you thank you Rachel that's been a real pleasure Polly, Rachel, thank you so much. That was fantastic. And as you say, it's such a poignant moment to hear this conversation and, and such an inspiring note to end on for us all to make some noise. So thank you so much for your insights. And thank you everyone to watching at home and for tuning in this evening and for all of your brilliant questions. Remember that you can order Polly and Rachel's books from Newham Books, the details of which are being posted now in the chat again. And do look out for our forthcoming events in the next couple of weeks. Next Wednesday on the 19th of July, We'll be hearing Guy Vince speak about climate migration and her new book, Nomad Century, with the FT's Henry Mance. And then on Monday the 24th, two weeks from today, novelist Colm Tabeen will be speaking about his new essay collection with the poet Sean Hewitt. Details of both of those events can be found on our website. Thank you so much again and good night. Thank you.